is horrifying for me. Uh, the Fed now is, uh, I think, a settlement system. Hello, everyone. Today, our guest Rick Rule is a prominent figure in the world of finance. During the recent Rule Symposium in Boca Raton, Florida, the U.S. Federal Reserve's new FedNow payment system became a prominent point of discussion. Rick Rule, a notable figure at the event, expressed his concerns about its implications during an interview. He finds it horrifying, as he believes FedNow is intended as a settlement system for a central bank digital currency, and he dislikes the idea of an additional layer of control being imposed by the government. So, if you're ready to navigate the exciting world of crypto, Bitcoin, and stocks, hit that subscribe button now. Join us on this exhilarating adventure towards financial growth and success. Don't miss out. Subscribe, like, and share today. Jim Rickards is always interesting when he talks about the history of current events, not how things happened over the last week, but rather where they come, came from. When he talks about, as an example, the weaponization of the U.S. dollar really beginning with the then Secretary of the Treasury, John Connolly, in the Nixon administration saying, our currency is your problem. The United States threatened to internationalize the imposition of U.S. values through the currency in 1968. Uh, that understanding of history, uh, as an example, I think is extremely important. On a much more cellular level, uh, every public company that's an exhibitor here is owned in my accounts or accounts I managed. But being able to walk around booth to booth uh, and question the people one on one about companies that I thought I knew about, the amount that you can learn by asking, even when you thought you understood things well, is amazing to me. Okay, so I think that should be a lesson to everybody if you're still learning, even about the companies that you brought here, there's there's so much to, for your average person to pick up. And I think that's an interesting point you made about taking a step back and getting that big historical view. However, I think it can be difficult for people to recognize when they need to take the step back and get the big picture, when they need to hone in and get the, the detailed picture. So any advice you can share there? Sadly, of course, uh, you need to do both. I, I, I think it's important that uh, investors, and I, I only want to speak about investors here because I don't know much about much else. I, I think it's important that investors continue to question their paradigm, as an example. Uh, and I think it's important to try and get a lot of points of view, but I think it's important to have a worldview too. But a worldview is where you make your money. Uh, a worldview is how you shape your finances so that you understand what you're doing. And it's also how you limit your mistakes. But you make your money where the rubber meets the road. So let's look at the conference as sort of a way to discuss what you just said. We try to bring big picture thinkers in place that have a certain worldview. It's contrarian, it's value oriented, it's libertarian. Not what you see in the mainstream media. If you agree with that big picture point of view, you go to door A. If you go don't, you go to door B. Door B doesn't lead to this conference, only door A does. So once you've decided that this this worldview is something that's going to shape the way that you live and the way that you act, it's important, I think, to align yourself with analysts and portfolio managers whose strategies mirror what's necessary for that worldview. And we've tried to do that here. We bring in people who have done resources, 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 and resources for 30 or 40 years. They didn't fail at crypto and then fail at narcotics, you know. Uh, and then what we try to do as a value add that I think all of your listeners need to do too, is examine the actions of serially successful people. So we have something called the living legends, uh, which are people who have built multi-billion dollar companies and natural resources from scratch. We're trying to take the worldview and distill it to actionable information. Uh, and the last thing that we do here is we limit the exhibitors to people who we know well enough that we own them. And I think that investors need to do the same thing that we've done with the conference themselves. They need to shape the worldview and they need to continue to question their worldview. 
when they establish what they think is actionable in terms of a worldview, they need to regard, they need to relate tactically to how to do it. They need to refresh themselves in terms of the sectors that they're interested in by people who have been serially successful. If you are an investor, as an example, who let's say just for fun that Charlotte McLeod owns a lumber yard or something like that, your life is wrapped up in that part of your business and your life and things like that. If you decide that you're going to invest in gold, you need to review the actions of somebody who spends their life doing gold. And I think that's important. I think that's the lesson. The macro is it important? Absolutely. But the micro is where the money's made. Exactly. Okay. I'm going to shift us over a little bit to current events now. And this is very current as we speak right now. We just had news from the Fed. 25 basis point rate hike, I think, as many people expected. However, I think one of the most, well, one of the comments that has stuck with me so far at this event came from Dr. Nomi Prince, who was talking about how maybe we give too much attention to the Fed. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on that. I think it depends on who you are. Um, if you're a trader, uh, if your orientation is shorter term, you have to pay attention to the Fed. Uh, Buffett said that no investment he's made for the last 50 years in his life would have mattered had he known what the Fed was going to do two years ahead of time. It really depends on what you do for a living. I'm increasingly coming to Buffett's point of view. It's odd, but as I have less time left on earth, I become more patient. Um, so for me, uh, understanding the perceptions of other investors is part of why I watch the Fed, but I care less and less about what the Fed is going to do. I believe is an example of the inexorable decline of the real purchasing power of the U.S. dollar while simultaneously believing that the U.S. dollar will hold value relative to other fiat currencies. In other words, it'll degrade less badly. The consequence of that is that a 25 basis point increase is of some interest to me in terms of gauging other people's response to it, but I'm much more interested in how much money a company is going to make over the next five years than what the Fed's going to do over the next 90 days. Speaking quite a bit here about this new Fed now system, I wondered if you could give us an explanation, quick explanation, and, and your thoughts on the impact. It's horrifying for me. Uh, the Fed now is, uh, I think, a settlement system designed as a foundation for a central bank digital currency. And the idea that my government wants to superimpose uh, a different layer of control on me is something I don't like. The idea that they have a currency unit that they can cancel and the cancelable technology is built in there calls into mind a recent circumstance in Canada where your prime minister uh, objected to the political group uh, of the truckers, as an example, and retroactively made contributing to them illegal and seized the bank accounts uh, of Canadians. Uh, the idea that he wouldn't have to seize them, but rather press a button and cancel them is terrifying to me. Absolutely terrifying to me. So, well, Fed now is proposed as a more efficient settlement system, a more efficient point to point system. We have a settlement system in place now on a global basis called SWIFT, which the U.S. has weaponized. The U.S. decided that uh, because they disagreed with what the Russians did, that they could, in effect, seize or cancel uh, $200 billion worth of Russian assets. If they can do it to the Russians, they can do it to you. Okay, interesting. I have been hearing a lot of this slippery slope kind of commentary. A counterpoint that I've heard is that, you know, they can, you know, they can see your credit card transactions. Or as you gave the example about the Canadian truckers, it already happened. But so for you, is the difference that it can be more instantaneous? Oh, there you go. Not cancelable. Your money, not cancelable. In my fist. Um, if I had U.S. dollars and I was afraid of the U.S. government as an example, and I wanted to, de I wanted to deposit them in the United Arab Emirates or Switzerland or some other place like that. I realized that my own defense mechanisms might be more appropriate to me, but I'm concerned about me. There's an order of magnitude difference uh, between cash and a central bank digital currency. If you combine the central bank digital currency with artificial intelligence, with the Chinese uh, social credit scoring, uh, 
where that leads is truly ugly. From an American context, your American audience needs to think, uh, if as an example, they're Republican, how would they feel about Biden being able to cancel their currency if he didn't like the way they think? Uh, by contrast, if you're a Democrat, how would you like it if Trump's finger was on the trigger? Uh, neither of those circumstances are attractive to me. I think Canadians have a more recent exposure to the draconian nature of the official response to dissent. Uh, and I think that you need to look at uh, central bank digital currencies in that sense. Thank you for watching the interview highlights of Rick Rule. If you enjoy this highlight video, please kindly subscribe and help share this video for us to share more of this valuable content. Thank you.